hope you're still awake. <laughs> I'm doing nice. <laughs> uh, heckled with oranges before I start. <laughs> First fruits. <laughs> So I woke up at 3 a.m. this morning with these niggling thoughts, and it felt like God was um, wanting me to rewrite parts of this talk. And I'm like, come on, <laughs> 3 a.m., are you freaking joking me? <laughs> I mean, what I said was, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. <laughs> However, Lord, I would have appreciated it if you'd thought to mention this stuff a little earlier. <laughs> like when I was awake. Just saying, perhaps you might bear it in mind for future reference. So basically, this is a recast version of what I was going to say. Um, and I warn you, it's the end of the day, and this is dense, fast, and furious, so you'll need to concentrate. It's quite different from the other one, and you might not like it. <laughs> so what I want to do is speak about the gospel of hope. It's easy to turn the news on and watch the news and come away feeling heavy-hearted. Sometimes it feels like the nations of the world, our own nations included, are just plunged in darkness and strife and grief with conflict at local and national and international levels, wars and rumors of wars and greed and injustice, violence. And I don't think things are any worse overall than they used to be at all. Um, the world has always been this way, but it's hard to imagine it ever not being this way. And sometimes with John Lennon, we like to imagine a world that's not infected with so much conflict and violence, but it seems like an impossible dream. And that is quite a depressing thought. I'm a sensitive soul, though I seem thick-skinned. And uh, that is, I sometimes come away feeling quite depressed about that. So what I want to do is talk in this, in this talk, look at what some of the scripture has to say about the nations and the hope of the nations. And indeed, at one level, the Bible can be thought of as a story of God's relationship with the nations of the world. And it is a picture that is both depressing and ultimately hopeful. In the Bible, the nations are immersed in sin and stumbling around in darkness and worshiping false gods. And that's not to say that there is no goodness and truth and beauty and wisdom and love in the world. Far from it. The Bible picks out plenty of good, beautiful and true things from the nations. And at the end of the Bible, the nations bring in all of their treasures, all the rich, diverse, cultural beauties of their different nations being brought in honor and worship of God. And so there is plenty that is admirable about human cultures and human history. And the biblical authors and the church ever since have sought to affirm and learn from that. Because cre remember, creation is fundamentally good. The fall is a deviation. <laughs> Sin is a turning away. But at root, at the ontological level, creation is good. So don't mishear me when I talk about the nations being bound up in sin or anything. But nevertheless, sin scorches its way through every area of society wreaking havoc, and we don't have to go far to see it. Indeed, we don't have to go anywhere. Not only are the nations of the world sunk in sin, but they also stand under divine judgment. Rejection of God's way has consequences, all sorts of consequences, and that is judgment. But the biblical story of the nations is ultimately positive. The nations will be illuminated by God, they will turn from their wickedness, and they will be restored. And we can picture this whole, this is the whole Bible now in one picture. Coming up. There it is. So this is the story of the nations. Here you can see that the nations are created good by God, and there's like a little trajectory that that arrow is going on. Uh, they're, they're destined to go on this journey, following the trajectory of the, the arrow, but they deviate from it, turning away from God, taking this downward road into sin. So the story of the Bible could be told as the story of the nation's recovery, turning back to God. How does, the, so that's the big picture, that's what I'm gonna say. Now we're gonna sort of go through that a bit more slowly. How does this return happen? In scripture, the plan of God is to use one nation chosen from among the nations to be the means of restoring the whole world. This one nation is Israel. 
So I'd like us to try to understand God's plan for Israel and the nations in terms of an interesting metaphor, that of first fruits. And here is something from Jeremiah. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it incurred guilt, disaster came upon them, declares the Lord. So what is God saying here through the prophet Jeremiah? What does it mean to speak about Israel as first fruits? The image might seem a bit obscure, but stick with me and I'll try and unpack it and hopefully it will start to make a bit of sense. So we need to try to enter imaginatively into the agricultural society of ancient Israel. The terrain of the promised land is very varied, different crops flourishing in different parts, different seasons of the year. The main crops in ancient Israel were grain, um, barley and wheat, figs, grapes, olives, onions, cucumbers, dates, pomegranates, that kind of thing. So this is an agricultural society. So it's perhaps no surprise that the three main pilgrim festivals in Israel's ritual calendar by which I mean Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, these were linked with Israel's story of escape from s slavery in Egypt, but also with the agricultural calendar. And you can see them on the diagram here. So Passover and unleavened bread, which are at about three o'clock, they mark the barley harvest, but are also primarily a thanksgiving for Israel's salvation from Egypt when the angel of death passed over and then they had to leave Egypt in a hurry. The Feast of Weeks, which later became known as Pentecost, marks the beginning of the wheat harvest. And it also recalls the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. The Feast of Ingathering, so that one's about five o'clock. The Feast of Ingathering, uh, which is around about nine o'clock, or tabernacles as it's better known, marks the end of the harvest. But it also recalls the time that Israel spent in the wilderness uh, with God in tabernacles. Now the first two of these pilgrim festivals, that is to say Passover and Pentecost, have first fruits connections. So allow me to explain them. The people would set aside the very first part of a crop that they gathered in order to dedicate it to God. And this offering, for obvious reasons, was known as the first fruits. So, during the Passover, on the day after the Sabbath, a sheaf of barley first fruits was gathered and brought by a family to the priest, and he would wave it before the Lord as an offering. And then the food belonged to Jehovah and was eaten by the priest and his family. The main festival that was linked to first fruits was what the Torah refers to as the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Weeks, weeks which we know as Pentecost. Pentecost was a harvest festival which marked the start of a season in which first fruits of different crops were offered, a season that continued right through until tabernacles. So Pentecost was the first fruits festival uh, in which Israel's farmers presented wheat offerings to the Lord. But what's the point of setting aside the first batch of a crop and presenting it to God in worship? What did it mean? Two things. First, it was an acknowledgement that the whole crop is from God and belongs to God. Deuteronomy 26 gives us the, some of the words that were used in the liturgy of presenting first fruits, and it makes this very clear. God granted the land to the people, the land upon which this crop has grown, and the offering is brought to acknowledge this gift. And the offerer says, Behold, now I bring the first fruit, the first of the fruits of the ground which you, O Lord, have given me. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that it was a sign of trust that the God who enabled the first part of the harvest to be gathered in will enable the rest to be brought in. The first fruits then were a token or a sign that the full harvest would be reaped in due course. Does that make sense? Good, okay. So with this background in mind, let's go back to Jeremiah and it should make a bit more sense. Jeremiah's image is this. Israel has been set apart from the rest of the nations just like the first fruits are set apart from the rest of the harvest. And as the first fruits, they have been dedicated to God. So they are his. And this is what the Bible means when it speaks of their, them as being elect. So Jeremiah is saying that Israel belongs to God and consequently is not available to others to eat, which is obviously a metaphor, it means to hurt. Messing with God's people is to mess with what belongs to God and incurs disaster. This is 
Jeremiah's point. Thus, picturing Israel as a first fruits is a way to bring out an aspect of what it means for Israel to be the chosen people. However, although God's focus in Jeremiah is on Israel being set aside and dedicated to him, there is more going on in the idea of Israel as first fruits. The idea is that the whole harvest, which is to say all the nations, belong to God. And the first fruits, Israel, symbolize that all of this harvest, all of the nations, belong to God. Second, Israel as first fruits is the first part of the harvest to come. And it is a sign of the full harvest of the nations yet to come. There's a bit of squeaky stuff going on with the sand, or is that just me? Okay, maybe it's just me. So here we get a little clue as to Israel's election, its set of partners, that it's not merely elect for its own sake, but it is elect for the sake of the nations as well. And that's something I want to develop a little bit. So here we are ushered into one of the, some of the major themes of the Hebrew Bible. The nature and purpose of God's election or choosing of Israel, the relationship between Israel and the nations in God's purposes. Indeed, I want to suggest that the idea of God rescuing the nations through Israel is one way of understanding what the gospel is about, although perhaps a forgotten way of looking at it. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> Consider first the climax of God's call to Abram in Genesis 12. The Lord promises the old man numerous descendants and a land for them, and he says... I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So the blessing of the families of the earth through the descendants of Abram is what I want you to notice. The promise casts its shadow across the whole Bible. Notice how Paul picks it up in Galatians 3 verse 8. Paul writes, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you, all the nations shall be blessed. So, see how Paul describes this idea of the nations being, being blessed through Abraham. And he says that this promised blessing is fulfilled by the nations being justified through faith in the Messiah. Indeed, he says that the promise to Abraham, that when, in, when God made this promise to Abraham, he preached the gospel to him. So the nations being saved through Abraham's descendants, or more specifically through one particular descendant, namely the Messiah who represents the nation, the Messianic King Jesus, that's not just any old biblical theme. It is the gospel. Here is how it works. Oh, there it is. This is, this is sort of how it works. It didn't quite go according to this, but this is the plan, right? So God creates humanity. So you can see Israel called out from the nations to, to be the means by which the nations are brought back to God. So God creates humanity in Adam, and his ultimate purpose is a human, humanity-wide. And you see this in Genesis 1 to 11. We trace a story of creation to the fall, nations of the ancient Near East emerging and so on. But these nations are warped. They grow up in being warped by sin, and the whole Bible is a story of how God works to undo the crippling power and effects of sin by bringing the nations back to himself. And how does he do that? It begins by God choosing to set aside one couple, Abraham and Sarah. He makes a binding covenant with Abraham. Abraham will have a son with his wife Sarah, from the son will come a chosen nation, and through that nation, through its Messiah, will come blessing to the nations. There's a few important points about Israel's election that I want to just pick out briefly. First, Israel's chosenness is inextricably interwoven with several other theological motifs. The promise to the patriarchs, covenant relationship, covenant law, the land, divine blessing, divine presence, and so on. Second, Israel is chosen primarily to be the people of Jehovah and to know him. Hence the famous covenant formula, you will be my people and I will be your God. So Israel is chosen to be God's beloved people, his treasured possession, Sagola. The Bible multiplies metaphors to capture the nature of this relationship. Israel is the husband, 
No, Israel is the wife, Jehovah is the beloved husband. Jehovah is the father, Israel is the beloved son. Jehovah is like a mother in her compassionate love for her child. Jehovah is like a farmer, Israel is like the vineyard. Jehovah is the shepherd, Israel the sheep. Jehovah the master, Israel the servant. And Israel's first duty is to be the wife, the son, the fruitful vine, the servant. All these metaphors and more trying to capture something of Israel's identity as the chosen people. Third, Israel the guy, the man Israel, Jacob, himself was chosen over Esau. But individual Israelites are not chosen to be in the nation of Israel. Rather, as descendants of Israel, they share in God's election of him. So they are elect in Israel. They're not elect to be in Israel. So non-Israelites, such as Ruth, um, by joining with the people, come to share in the election of the nation. Ruth wasn't chosen to be in Israel, but once she joined with the people, she shares in their election. And the same thing goes for calling. God called Abraham and his descendants in the line of promise inherit his calling. God didn't individually call each Israelite, but the nation as a whole was called. And we could perhaps say that any Israelite was called by virtue of being in Abraham. Fourth, the elect nation was not chosen by God because of its own inherent merit, not because it was bigger, better, more devout, more moral. In fact, it was often very much not any of those things, as I said earlier today. This is not to suggest for a moment that election didn't require a right response. God very clearly requires obedience from Abraham and later from Israel, obedience that enabled them to participate in the blessings and promises of grace. But it is, to, it is to say that a failure to respond the right on their part did not nullify election. When Israel violated the covenant, it found itself living in the curses or the shadow of the covenant. But it didn't thereby cause the covenant to fail or their election to cease. God's Israel, election of Israel is irrevocable, no matter what Israel do. So they can't fall from grace, they can only fall in grace. And this is because the Abrahamic covenant of grace underpins the Sinai covenant, such that God will keep covenant with Abraham, even if Israel abandons God's laws. But without human obedience, the covenant can't reach maturity, can't be itself, as it were. So in the end, God promises a new covenant or a renewed covenant in which he will himself put his spirit in them and enable Israel to obey his commandments so that in that day, even Israel's response to God is a gifted response. Sorry, there's a lot and it's fast, but anyway, there it is. You can watch it again later. And for the viewers at home. <laughs> Fifth, God's election does have salvific implications, but only at a secondary level. So Israel's election is not an election to salvation. They're not chosen to be saved. But as God's chosen people, he promises to restore them when they fall and when they're exiled. They can expect restoration and salvation because of God's gracious and electing love. Sixthly, election is a task. We see this clearly with the election of individuals like Moses, who is chosen to lead, Aaron, who is chosen to be a high priest, uh, prophets who are chosen to speak on behalf of Jehovah. And we see it at the group level too. Israel, the nation, is chosen for divine service. First of all, the service of offering worship to God. Secondly, to be the instrument of God's blessing to the nations. So Israel is just thus chosen, not only for its own sake, but also for the sake of the, for want of a better word, non-elect. Whether the, non whether the non-elect receive blessing or curse depends upon the nature of their relationship to the chosen nation. I'm just sort of summarizing Old Testament stuff at the minute. So Israel's calling is to be a priestly kingdom. That is to say, a, a a community that mediates, like priests, the divine blessing to the world. But there's very little indication that this was understood in the Old Testament uh, in terms of evangelistic mission. Israel's primarily, primary mission was to be Israel. If they walk in the light of the Lord, the prophets say, then the nations would see and be drawn 
to acknowledge Jehovah as the one true God. And as such, they were to be a light to the nations. So this is a sort of centripetal rather than centrifugal mission. And then, finally, getting to the, the bit I'm talking about, there is hope for the idolatrous nations in the Old Testament. Some of the prophetic texts look forward to a time when the Gentile nations would come on a pilgrimage, they'd forsake their idols, and they would come on a pilgrimage to Zion to worship the God of Israel, to learn from his instruction, and to be his people. And even Assyria and Egypt in Isaiah 19, God says, my people. Not, not just Israel now, my people, but Assyria, my people, Egypt. The enemies, right? No, my people, says God. Here's just one text, famous one from Isaiah 2. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord shall be established as the highest of mountains, and all the nations shall flow to it, and many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Jehovah, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the Torah and the word of the Jehovah from Jerusalem. There are also visions in which the nations are presented as offering pleasing worship to God all over the world where they live. So here is Malachi, not to be confused with the famous Italian prophet Malachi. <laughs> For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. These eschatological visions do not mean that there's no longer any distinction between Israel and the nations, but rather the two unite together as equals to honor the one true God. So here is a vision of unity, but not of uniformity, where everybody and all the different cultural identities are sort of put in a blender. Cultural identities are preserved. And Israel's identity, actually, I was thinking this last night, it's not merely a cultural identity, it's a theological identity, but that's another thing and I come to that. No, I'm not gonna to come to that at all, no time. So the reason that the non-elect can have hope for the future is precisely because of God's election of Israel. Divine election is, strange as it might seem, a message of hope for the whole world. So Israel is elect from among the nations and has a relationship with God that the nations do not have, but the purpose of that ele election is for the ultimate blessing of those very nations to draw them into that covenant relationship with God. And in that sense, Israel is a first fruits of the whole harvest. Israel's election is good news for the whole world. In theory, but there's a problem. A complication. Israel itself, in the Old Testament, does not live up to its calling. Israel itself is idolatrous and in darkness. Israel itself is blind and in exile and unable to bring its mission to the nations to completion. How can they be a light when they're in darkness? So Israel's story comes to parallel that of Adam and of the nations, a fall away from God into judgment. So God is going to have to rescue and restore Israel, make a new covenant with them, enabling them, putting his spirit in them and enabling them to obey and, thereby, and then to save the nations. So the vision of, is there a picture that goes then a little dark? Yeah, so, so this is a story, you see. The problem is Israel, instead of sort of going God's way and being the light, has actually collapsed and started following the same pattern as the nations. So Israel itself needs to be rescued in order for the plan for the nations to get finished. Does that make sense? It's terribly complicated. Ah, but the Bible's a big book, so, you know. And I might have got it completely wrong, by the way. <laughs> this is what it looks like it's saying to me. So, in sum, the vision of the prophets of hope goes something like this. Israel is currently living in darkness and sin and captivity, just like the nations. But God will rescue Israel and restore them. He will make a new covenant with them in which he will put his spirit in them and enable them to obey him. And then the nations themselves will see God's light in Israel and they will forsake their idols and they will 
come to the true God and follow his ways and worship him. And in this way, God's kingdom will reign over all the earth and all of creation will be restored. And there are these visions of global peace and swords and plowshares and all of that kind of stuff. So how is this going to come about? How does God rescue his people and then the nations? And the answer is this. He does it himself. As Brad said, he rolls up his sleeves and stretches out his arm. In the person of Jesus Christ, God comes to deliver. Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. And as such, he represents the whole nation before God. And God before the whole nation. And the church has often and very importantly stressed how critical it is that Jesus is fully human. Absolutely. But it is also critical in scripture that Jesus is fully Jewish and remains so. He is the Messiah. And in this representative role, his story comes to embody Israel's story and thus humanity's story too. So on the cross, Tom Wright helpfully argues, Jesus takes Israel's exile to its climax and he bears their sufferings. And his resurrection then is Israel's return from exile. There's a little picture to make this clearer in a sec. So here we go. Here's the picture. So you see the story of the nations and Israel and Jesus is like the Messiah called out to represent Israel. And then on the cross, he, his story sort of shares in Israel's suffering and exile and so on, which is also a sharing in the sufferings of the nations. And then we have resurrection, which is where I wanna go. So, we see Jesus called from among Israel as its messianic king and priest, bearing their exile, bearing humanity's expulsion from Eden on the cross. And then the turning point. The story gets back on track because God raises the Messiah from the dead. This is the central moment in the plot because this is salvation. This is the return of exile. This is the new exodus. This is the new creation. This is the kingdom of God. In his death, Jesus stands as representative in solidarity with Israel and with the nations. And they come to share in the deliverance of God in his resurrection. If we unite or if we are united with the Messiah by the Holy Spirit, we come to share in his new life just as he shared in our death. If that was complicated, it's going to get a little bit more complicated still and there's going to be zombies if that keeps you awake. <laughs> Where are we now in the plot line? Has new creation appeared or not? Yes. And no. <laughs> so the kingdom, you know all this stuff, right? Everyone knows this stuff. The kingdom is here now, but it's not yet here. New creation is here, but it's not yet. Salvation has come and it is still to come. Theologians call this inaugurated eschatology. And they mean that we see real glimpses of the future breaking into the present in the forgiveness and in healing and in deliverance and when the Spirit's breaking through in the lives of people. But the fullness is still to come. So what does that mean in terms of the story of Israel and the nations? It means that right now there are some among God's people of Israel who have embraced Jesus as Messiah and have received the Holy Spirit, the sign of the new covenant. These Jewish followers of Jesus are an anticipation of the restored new covenant of Israel spoken of by the prophets. But we also see many Jews, many followers of the Jewish Messiah among nations, Gentile people like me, many of you. We are an anticipation of the pilgrim nations who join restored Israel to worship Jehovah together. We are united to Israel's Messiah and grafted into his relationship with God. And we too receive the Holy Spirit and become part of this culturally diverse new covenant people of God. So together, these Jewish and Gentile believers form the new age community of God, the ecclesia, often usually translated as church, but I'll usually say ecclesia because I prefer it. 
less connotations. So the ecclesia, where Jews and Gentiles are united as one body in the Messiah, while remaining Jews and Gentiles. We can picture this like that. More complicated. What you can see here then is the ecclesia, the church, which is a community of Jews and Gentiles united, sharing in the resurrection of life of Jesus. So notice how their story is following his now. His resurrection story is the shape of their this community. And there's Jews and Gentiles kind of woven together into one body here. You also notice that this salvation is not yet completed in the experience of these believers, which is us, uh, indicated by the fact that the lines aren't solid. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> Finally, you will see that most of the Jews and Gentiles carry on not believing in the Messiah and not participating as yet in this resurrection. Does that make sense? <laughs> A little bit less sure about that. So, here's the question. What is the fate of the Jews and Gentiles who are not part of the ecclesia, not currently experiencing the reality of the life that God offers in Jesus. At one level, they remain bound. I'm going to qualify all this with a zombie thing in a minute, so just this might sound a bit odd, but at one level, they remain bound to the old age and its fate. So what will become of them? The mainstream view of the church since the fifth century has been as follows, that they get thrown in the fire. So here, on this vision, the ecclesia, are, that's us, we are elect, chosen in Christ, and those who remain outside Christ are sent to everlasting damnation because we are elect, we've been chosen instead of everybody else. I think this is a misunderstanding of what the church is. And that's why I put a question mark over the fire. If this view is correct, it would be a big disappointment because the biblical view is of a global restoration in Christ. If the actual delivery on that promise was just the salvation of a small remnant in Israel and a few from among the nations, we might be excused for feeling shortchanged. We may feel that the future of creation has not been determined by the narrative of Jesus, by the gospel, but by the fall of Adam. We may feel that this disappointing plot is one in which grace abounds, but sin abounds all the more. But the truth, I suggest, is a lot grander and more hopeful. The truth about the future is the resurrection and ascension of humanity in the second Adam, the human, Jesus. The truth about the future is that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. In brief, if you're falling asleep, it's just this. Sin loses, love wins. Okay, just remember that. <laughs> so, how are we going to understand the ecclesia a little bit more correctly? The ecclesia is not elect instead of the rest, but on behalf of the rest. So let's go back to the theme of first fruits and pull a few threads together. Remember I said that the first fruits offerings that were at Passover and Pentecost. So let's have a look at how the New Testament picks up on both of those. First of all, Christ is the Passover first fruits. Notice how Paul develops this in 1 Corinthians 15. A couple of verses. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, meaning those who've died. And then he says, each will be raised in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Paul is speaking of Christ's resurrection as the first fruits of the resurrection of the dead. So Christ is the first fruits in that he's raised first. <laughs> yeah. And also that his resurrection is a promise of the full resurrection of the harvest yet to come in. Resurrection harvest yet to come in. And as an aside, it is quite interesting to observe that when the Passover fruits were offered at Passover, right, that you get the Passover lambs are sacrificed and there's a Sabbath, and then on the day after the Sabbath, they offer the first fruits. And so in the year that Jesus was crucified, as the Passover lambs were being uh, killed, it says in John's Gospel, uh, then there's a Sabbath, and then the first fruits are offered on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. So the Passover resurrection is fulfilled in Christ. He is the first fruits of the Passover, resurrection first fruits. And notice that he's not resurrected um, instead of his people, 
but on behalf of his people, right? That's the whole way it works. But if Christ is the Passover first fruits, then the ecclesia is the Pentecostal first fruits. And it's not an accident that the birth of the church took place on the day of Pentecost, because this points to the very meaning of the church. God, as he promises, pours out his new covenant spirit upon the Jewish believers who are gathered that day in Jerusalem. And Peter stands up and he says, hey, that new age in which God pours out his spirit that was coming, the last days, this is now, it's happening, you can see it in front of you. And then through the book of Acts, we track the story of how um, the Samaritans and then full-blown Gentiles who are filled with this very same new covenant spirit and joined into this end time community. And the gospel goes out from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth, from Israel to the nations. So he's all following like the, the Old Testament pattern. So notice then, and this is the verse, this is, the whole talk is actually just this verse, right? From James. This is James of Jerusalem, the most important guy in the early church. Uh, the brother of Jesus. And this is what he says about the ecclesia. Of his own this is God, of his own, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So I'm in Denver. So I will quote Craig Blomberg, New Testament scholar from Denver Seminary, on this verse. Believers are the first harvest that God is reaping from all that he fashioned prior to the eventual recreation of the entire cosmos. Preach it, Craig. <laughs> And uh, maybe we can out you as a universalist, <laughs> which I know you're not. <laughs> so. But yes, you are. Now get in trouble and get the sack. Okay, I didn't say any of that. Cut it. From <laughs> Jewish believers in Jesus, then, are the first fruits of all Israel that will be saved in Romans 11. So notice in Romans 11 how Paul speaks about the Jews who believe the gospel. He says they're the remnant. Uh, they're like a small group that God has preserved, even though most of the nation has forsaken him. They're a remnant from the rest of the Jewish people. But this is what he says. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. This is what he says. So the, the remnant are like the dough is offered as first fruits. Slightly odd thing here. This is from Numbers 15. It's about how when the harvest is reaped, they make some bread, and the first dough is set aside by God, baked as bread, and so on. The Jewish believers in Jesus, Paul is saying, are like this first loaf. The holiness, he says, of this first batch of dough extends out to the rest of the dough, which is to say the whole people of Israel, the whole Jewish people. So the whole nation as a whole, even though they haven't recognized their Messiah yet, the, well, yeah, you get where I'm going. So in Romans 11, Paul argues that the division within Israel currently between um, the elect remnant and what he calls the rest, <laughs> it is a temporary distinction. And that in the end, the deliverer will come from Zion, this is Christ, and all Israel will be saved. The argument is complex, we're not going to get into it, but just note this. Jewish Messiah believers are a first fruits on behalf of the rest of the nation. They are a remnant and a sign of hope that God has not given up on Israel, and one day he will complete his redemption of her. Israel remains beloved on behalf of the patriarchs. Those of us who are not Jewish find ourselves fully accepted as Gentiles in Christ on equal standing covenant basis uh, with our Jewish brothers and sisters, and I will argue briefly that we are the um, first fruits of the nations. Oh, there's a picture of it there. You see, so this is how I think the story really goes. So we're like an anticipation, the first fruits, and the full restoration of Israel and all the nations that will come. So this is a much better story. I mean, it's a lot more positive, right? I like that ending. That ending, that's the right one, okay? So just remember that. <laughs> Does this mean, so notice that the fire's gone. I couldn't fit the fire into the picture. It would have got too complicated. Does this mean there's no place for judgment? Well, not at all. But it does mean that judgment cannot be the end of the story. There is judgment, then there is salvation. And we find this pattern in Israel's prophets. I'm just going to pick out a couple of these. because Let's have a look at this one from Zephaniah. 
I want you to notice the two halves. Notice the really strong language that's used for the destruction bit. And then notice the stuff that's like, oh, it's not the end, okay? Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger. For in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. That's kind of bad, right? That's the end of the story. <laughs> then he says, and notice the first word, for at that time. So this is not some like moving on to a different topic. In the NIV, they add a subtitle in here so you don't notice the connection. For at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. Hmm, I thought you'd just consume them all. Um, that, yeah, forget that one. Um, just come to the next one. Moab shall be destroyed. That's a pretty strong word and shall no longer be a people because he magnified himself against the Lord. Yet, I will restore the fortunes of Moab in the latter days, declares the Lord. Well, there's no one left to restore. Well, this just teaches us to be very careful when the Bible uses very strong rhetoric of destruction. We need to be careful how we read it because God is a God of resurrection and he's able to sort of, oh, it's dead, it's the end. No, it's not. Resurrection. <laughs> Here it is again. I will bring disaster upon Elam. My fierce anger, declares the Lord. I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them, declares the Lord. But in the latter days, I will restore the fortunes of Elam, declares the Lord. So there is death and there is resurrection. Now, I'm going to go off piste here, just slightly. This is the zombie bit. The zombie bit. There's no bit. Yeah, the zombie bit comes up in the right. Okay. Just step aside for a little minute and ask... I'm going to add a little complication into the story that's already really complicated, and I'm sure none of you are awake anymore, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I kept it out to simplify things, but to leave it out altogether would be unhelpful and misleading. So here we go. What exactly is the status of those outside the ecclesia in regards to salvation? Are they saved or are they not saved? Are they elect or are they not elect? And the short answer is this. Yes. The slightly less short answer is this. There is a fundamental now and not yet aspect to this issue. So, yes, they are saved. And no, they're not yet saved. Yes, they are elect. And no, they are not elect. So how does this work? Because, oh my goodness, how is anyone meant to get their head around this? Like this, and like this. Jesus, the second Adam, our representative, he has united himself to our humanity. And he carries our story in his story. I love the way Peter put this yesterday when he said, um, in sin we try to write ourselves out of the story. And God in Christ writes us back into the story. And he doesn't need our permission to do it. He just goes and does it. Right? Just, uh, yeah, you want to be out? Well, I'm putting you back in. <laughs> I'm writing you back in the plot. So in Jesus... All have died and all have been raised to new life. So what this means is that Jesus did not die to make salvation possible. When he died and rose again, he accomplished salvation. So universal salvation is not something we hope might happen in the future. It has already happened in Jesus' resurrection. New creation is the truth right now. Universal reconciliation is already achieved in Christ. So all people are already saved. In the same way, Christ is God's chosen one, his beloved son. He is the elect one. And in his election, all Israel and all humanity are elect, chosen, in him, that's what it says in Ephesians, chosen in Christ before, not chosen to be in Christ, chosen in Christ, because he's elect, we participate in his election. There is a fundamental sense in which this is the truth of the matter. This is the real truth about the world when it gets down to rock bottom. But obviously we need to say something more than that or we'll get very confused. Because when we look around, we don't see salvation, the salvation that's achieved in Christ manifest everywhere. We don't see all things made new. 
So there is a critical not yet sense in the New Testament about this new creation and salvation. So at another level, if we haven't been united to Christ by the Holy Spirit, such that we can participate in the life, then we are in Adam and in sin and under condemnation. We are not elect, we are not saved. That is the truth about us, but it's not the final truth, it's not the fundamental truth. Now, that's a little bit hard to get a hedge brand, so here's the zombie bit, zombies, right. This is a slightly quirky illustration from the graphic novel and TV series, The Walking Dead. It's basically a depressing, yet at another level, quite inspiring <laughs> zombie feast. The earth, the basic premise is the earth has been infested with this zombie virus and everybody has it. However, the virus only activates when a person dies. And then when you die, your inner zombie comes out. You know, this virus sort of goes live and you sort of, whatever zombies do, eat people's brains. Or whatever. So pick an episode of The Walking Dead, any episode, put it back in the pack. Uh, and what you'll find is there's two basic types of creature in it. There are zombies and there are non-zombies. That is to say, humans. What is the status of the humans, the heroes of the story? Well, they're not zombies, right? They're humans. But at another level, they are zombies. Because their zombie status, in one sense, is already achieved. Because they have been infected and there is no cure. When they die, they're going to come back as the walking dead, unless someone smashes their brains in. So they have this kind of in-between status, right? The humans are not zombies, but they are, and they will be. Does that make sense? Okay. So new creation in Christ is a bit like that in reverse, right? So now you have to imagine everyone's a zombie to start with, right? So. Um, humanity in Adam has achieved the sort of universal zombie status. We are all zombies in captivity to sin and death. In Christ, all humanity is injected with this new creation antidote. So when Christ in the incarnation, identify, Christ identifies himself with our fallen zombified humanity because he, he assumes it so that he can heal it. So in the incarnation, Christ zombifies, is zombified, as it were. Um, where was I? Right. And what he does is he takes our zombified through humanity through death to new life and divine glory. And what he does is he reforms and perfects our humanity in himself. And so we are all de-zombified. In Christ, no one is a zombie and everyone is a human. The antidote has been given. However, it is not immediately activated. So we're still wandering around, around as zombies, unaware that this antidote is already a done deal for us. We're zombies, but we're not zombies. What it is, the Holy Spirit then comes and activates the antidote in us. The Spirit opens our eyes to see the truth of God in Christ. He awakens faith in our heart. He enables sanctification, which is really a process of de-zombification. So that step by step, we become less zombie and more human. We become more like Christ. We become what Christ, what Christ has already achieved, what we already are in Christ. The Spirit enables that to become an experienced reality in our lives. And one day the Spirit will raise us up with resurrection bodies and all traces of the zombie will be gone forever. That is a future reality. But in another sense, it's a reality now. Christ is risen. The Spirit has been poured out in our hearts. Do you kind of get the idea? It is. Do you get the idea? It's complicated. <laughs> It's this that makes it difficult to speak in simple ways about the situation now. We're zombies, but in Christ we're not zombies, we're human. And in the, fut in the, in the future, the antidote that's already been given, it guarantees the final transformation of zombified humanity at long last into human beings. So, I hope that made some sense. Getting back, and finally, I'd like to wrap up. Do I have time to wrap up with a... I do, okay. Uh, sketching how this big story works out in the book of Revelation. And I hope to, by doing this to show that this isn't just 
a sort of fringe way of pulling the Bible together, but actually it's quite central to the way the Bible thinks about the big story. So what do we see about the story of the nations in the book of Revelation? Because they crop up rather a lot. Well, what's very clear is this. The nations are the baddies. They are deceived by the beast. They stand in opposition to God and Jesus. The kings of the earth, the nations, consistently not good. The church in the book of Revelation is distinguished from the nations consistently. The church are a community that are called out from every tribe and language and people and nation. So the focus is on the great national and ethnic and cultural diversity of the Jesus community. It includes representatives from all the different peoples and groups and languages and nations of the world. And the church in Revelation is just like a microcosm of all the nations. And what are the destinies in Revelation of these two groups, the nations and the ecclesia? Hmm, not so good. The nations are doomed to judgment and destruction, smoke and eternal fire, and the ecclesia inherit life. Well, that sounds like the opposite of what I've just been saying, right? But if that was all it said in Revelation, then it would be. Fortunately, it is not. And there's more. Consider the infamous 144,000 so beloved of Jehovah's Witnesses. On one common interpretation of the 144,000, they represent the church as a whole. They're parallel to the same group as the multi-ethnic group that can't be numbered singing the praise of the Lamb. In other words, the church. And this is what we read about them. It is these, the 144,000, who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. The ecclesia, the church, if this understanding of the 144,000 is correct, are redeemed from mankind as first fruits of a bigger harvest to come. So the judgment of the nations, which Revelation presents in exceptionally dark and graphic imagery, is it the end of their story? If we look at the pictures of destruction from the nations from chapters 14 and 20, if we take them out of context, it really looks like end of story, final doom, and all of that kind of stuff. Here's chapter 14. It talks about those who worship the beast and have his mark put on them, which Revelation makes clear is everyone apart from those who follow the Lamb. This is what happens to them. They will drink the wine of God's wrath poured out full strength into the cup of his anger. They're going to be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever and they have no rest day and night. That does not sound good. That's that, right? That's, that's got to be the end of the story, except that it's not. Because following this judgment... This is the victory song that the saints sing. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord, God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship you. Well, hold on a minute. They're kind of in smoke and fire, right? Forever, right? How is this going to happen? Well, somehow... The saints are going, these nations who are currently in smoke and fire, they will come and worship you. So maybe, maybe it wasn't the end. It gets even better. After we read in chapter 19 about the nations making war against the lamb, being defeated, subsequently cast into the lake of fire, again we're thinking, lake of fire, that's kind of the end of the story, right? But then we read this about the new Jerusalem. By its light, the nations walk. And the kings of the earth, remember, these are the baddies. Everyone knows these guys. These are the guys in the lake of fire. If you've been reading the book, they haven't been anyone else. They're not the church. These are the guys in the lake of fire. The kings of the earth, the nations, will bring their glory into it, and her gates will never be shut. There will be no more nights there, and they will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. This is hope after hope has ended, right? This is hope beyond hope. This is a kind of death, where is thy sting thing. 
chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb and in the middle of, through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielded its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. So this vision of all the nations and all their kings who had previously resisted God and the gospel, now they are coming to worship God, it's straight out of the visions of the Old Testament prophets. This is finally the end time pilgrimage of the nations promised by the prophets. And the church called out from every nation is the first fruits, an anticipation of this. So here, following the harvest, following the judgment, we see the final harvest finally being reaped. So revelation that at first sight may appear deeply pessimistic about the destiny of the nations turns out to be supremely optimistic. I'll just wrap up very quickly now, very quickly. Of course, this vision of global salvation um, presented throughout scripture is, comes in various visions and symbols and I don't know exactly what it will look like and how it will happen and I don't want to be overly wooden in trying to interpret the scriptures. Um, what I do though want to do is look to them to inspire my heart hopewards to an ultimate end in which the earth will be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea and in which God will be all in all. And I also look to them to inspire in me a fresh sense of the calling and mission of the church here and now. Because the church then exists for God and it belongs to God. But we are also called to be the tomorrow people. A new age community that embodies the values and hopes of the coming kingdom of God. A prophetic sign of hope to the world. A Christ-centered place where forgiveness and joy, reconciliation, compassion, justice, love, goodness, truth, beauty, God-focused worship find a home, a kingdom light to the nations. And that's a high calling. It makes church kind of exciting. Not a bunch of people just being all cliquey, but a prophetic sign of hope to the world, existing for the sake of the world, for the benefit of the world. We are, of course, a community on the way, and we often fall short of our calling, sometimes repeatedly, horribly, and inexcusably short. But the God of grace never gives up on us, and the divine vision calls us again and again and again to be the body of Christ, his feet that go to the needy, his mouth that speaks truth to power and life to the dead, his healing and comforting hands. So Lord, make us a channel of your peace. Our Father in heaven, may your name be hallowed on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.